Welcome everyone to this seminar. Thank you for joining us today. My name is uh, Sharif Andraus. I'm the Global Natural Resources Leader for BDO. Um, today is the first of two seminars we're running on a natural resources accounting update. The next one is tomorrow and hopefully you've, uh, you've um, subscribed for that one too. There's lots of uncertainty in the world in terms of what's happening with COVID. Um, in the natural resources world, there are some companies that are unaffected. Some companies are affected in a great, great way, whether it's positively or negatively, negatively, and certainly everything in between. What we're going to be talking today is about the financial reporting implications of those uh, of COVID and what that might mean. And hopefully we'll come up with some really interesting thoughts about, think about topics you haven't even thought about, but certainly get you prepared, ready for your next set of accounts that are coming up at the end of June. So today we've got a couple of uh, experts who'll be taking you through those. Uh, Wayne Basford will be taking most of the talking, but first of all, I'll leave you with uh, Susan Elmeadow Hall, who, shall, who will be facilitating this session. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Cherise. It's great to be part of this, and it's an unusual time for us doing this, not face-to-face -face with our clients, but um, virtually. To start off, we wanted to consider what the impact of COVID would have on your businesses and what you expect it to be. So I'm going to launch a polling question for you. So you've got a question that is coming up. And it is, do you anticipate that the preparation of your 2020 financial reports will be more complicated because of COVID-19? And be interesting to see, um, you know, what you think, whether it's going to have a significant, minor or no impact, or whether really it's a bit too early to say. In relation to today's session, we do have the opportunity for you to ask questions. And you'll see that um, on the screen that you can provide a question. So as you, if you have any questions, Wayne will be talking and providing the update. And as we come to certain section ends, then we'll have the opportunity to ask some questions. So if you can have a think about anything that you'd like to know, need a bit more clarification on, just feel free to add those questions and I'll pass them on to Wayne um, as we progress. So 57 people have voted. We're getting the votes coming through. Just collating those responses. So we're getting a good response here. 70% of people have voted. Okay, so the results are in. Um, some of you have said significantly, so 10%, 62 to a minor expense, 5% not at all, and 23% too early to say. Um, and so that probably is what we were almost anticipating um, the results would be. Um, hopefully people don't have a significant impact, but. I will hand over to Wayne because I think his view is that potentially this is a significant issue for 2020 financial reports. Wayne, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Susan. Um, just working out 
we are, and this is my first webinar, so all weird glitches that might happen. So good morning, everybody. And as Susan possibly impl implied, I view this as one of the most, potentially one of the most challenging reporting seasons ever. And I've been in this game for, for nearly 30 years. I, as a technical accountant, am very likely spending two or three evenings a week talking about challenges of how we don't know how to account for the, the consequences of, of COVID-19. And first off, you'd think, well, it really impacts tourism, retail, hospitality, travel, etc. But when you put your mind to it, for many people in the natural resources area, this is going to cause all sorts of interesting challenges for, uh, for those that are involved in preparing the accounts. And I think definitely it increases a lot of risk for both the directors that are approving these financial statements and the auditors that are saying that they comply with accounting standards and are true and fair. Um, when we started up, when we planned this session pre-COVID, we were just going to talk about leases and how was implementation of 15 going and what was the new interpretation on, on certain tax positions. Then we were going to split this session, then we're going to split the session into COVID and the update. By the time we've listed out all the issues, we've now decided to do two sessions that will be predominantly just COVID. Key things looking at it, we've got going concern, impairment, anything that you fair value, be it, be it loans, receivables, hedges, property what is the fair value at the moment? Have you got provisions? And we'll cover in extensive detail tomorrow, the real problem or, or the real solution to COVID is disclosure. People are going to be making lots of judgments, lots of estimates. Need, people really need to be considering how do you disclose those uh, issues? Share-based payments, all of this is to do with liquidity. The world needs to save cash. The natural resources sector needs to save cash. So most likely you're gonna be looking at settling liabilities in shares rather than uh, paying out cash. So this session is only really gonna look at the business impacts. And then I'll deal with just two of the key uh, financial reporting areas, going concern and impairment. And going concern is going to be a major challenge for us all. And remember the whole pre premise of preparing and applying accounting standards is that based on you are a going concern. And impairment, impairment being impairment of E, e impairment of fixed assets, impairment of receivables, impairment of deferred tax assets. Impairment is a fundamental challenge of, of this reporting season. In case nobody's noticed, we have global pandemic. And we've got one of these questions, is it appropriate to call it who? or is it the WHO? I admit to being in the WHO camp of the world, but that is significant for anybody that reported across the 31st of December or the 31st of March, whether this is or was a post balance sheet event that you've not reported yet. For everybody that's reporting in June, it's happened and it needs to be factored in to when you prepare your financial statements, 30th of June. And looking at how this we think will pan out, going concern. Everybody, the capital markets are confused. We've seen some really good capital raises at the moment, 
but obviously those capital raises are sucking available capital out. People are nervous knowing where to invest their capital. And we've got issues, obviously, in the natural resources sector. The unbelievable happened that we've actually saw oil go negative, a concept nobody's ever seen. But obviously, gold was battling the recession and the safe haven as per normal. It, you know, it's a question for people out there are projects stalled or delayed? And you, this can be are you actually able to get your teams, your drill rigs, your, your geos on site? Is it safe to get them on site? Are there airlines flying on there? Have governments closed borders? Are your staff willing to go on site anymore? And the other thing that seems to be coming out is, have you really got the equipment? So although all the headlines are the world has run out of PPE, run out of masks, run out of ventilators, so much of the world's spare parts actually come from China. And a number of engineering projects are dependent on China properly getting op open to manufacture and then their ports opening. So this could well store projects. Going back to the lack of capital, liquidity issues. The world faces liquidity issues, very individuals do, and certainly everybody in terms of the natural resources sector. What is your liquidity needs? And that leads to two aspects. I think people are going to renegotiate debt. People are going to renegotiate convertible notes. And obviously, renegotiating debt, renegotiating convertible notes is a key accounting challenge of how do you apply IFRS 9, WSB 9 to those renegotiations. And as I touched on before, my expectation is people in this sector are going to try and use more share based payments. So people are going to try and save cash by paying in shares. And depending on which uh, sector you're in, whether you're in gold or whether you're in oil, et cetera, you might find that some of your existing share based payments are out of the money or are not performing as they were intended to do. So you could well be thinking about modifying existing share based payments to incentivize your employees and again to save cash. We're looking at this from a, an audit stock point of view. So it's not business as normal. One of the key things that people are even struggling with are can we attend stock takes? Can we go and verify assets? Are the borders open and are our audit teams able to go and attend those stock takes or verify assets? Obviously, a lot of people in this call have got operations overseas. A lot of people on this call have got operations in Africa or, or, or in Asia. Have we considered whether those auditors are in lockdown? Whether, they're, whether the auditors are actually able to meet the uh, group timetables and instructions. We're mostly in a world of working from home. Has working from home weakened your controls in any way? Have you, you know, all the systems and controls and checks that were in place when you were in the office, have things fallen between the cracks? and will open you up to, to error. Sharif started the call and myself and Sharif are working with on a number of these valuation issues and how to value under this world of change and challenge. Most people will be valuing assets. If you've got an impairment trigger, you'll need to de determine the recoverable amount. What is the recoverable amount in 2020. You've got to look at your impairment of loans, your receivables. How do you value the, your loss, your, your expected credit loss? Share-based payments, 
share based payments have been rene renegotiated it's not an orderly market so how do you look at share based payments and the same with with renegotiating your debt and your your convertible notes uh, we've got the business impact on you again oil price commodity price closing borders not being able to get staff not being able to get your parts not being able to get the equipment on site that you need so all of this is going to make as i believe a very very interesting reporting season so I believe susan will go over to another poll I will indeed, Wayne. We've got our next poll. So I've just launched this poll. Has your operation been impacted by COVID-19? So this is really your business operations. And, you know, obviously for certain producers, depending on the commodity that you're in, as Wayne said, oil producers, crazy times with the oil price, gold producers, things are looking better, but also those issues around the supply chain and, you know, are you getting access to, a, are you able to do your exploration or your development work? And how is your workforce impacted? So. It's interesting seeing the results emerging. I've, we've got 42% of people voted so far. Um, So I'll just give you a couple of seconds and then I'll close off this poll. It's um, interesting in terms of comparing this to the first poll. So I think we're seeing more business impacts coming through. I'm gonna close the poll now. We've had 70% of people vote. And this is the result. So significantly is 27%. To a minor extent, 61%, 4% not at all, and 7% too early to say. So I'll hand back to you, Wayne. Is that what you were expecting? It's <laughs> I think it's potentially a bit worse than I was, I was expecting. And again, it doesn't necessarily correlate into the first poll. So, you know, there was a lot, much larger percentage there that significantly were impacted compared with those that thought the financial, that their financial report would be significantly impacted. And, you know, the telling one is, four, well, two telling ones are 4%, it's only 4% that's not at all. Um, so, very interesting that, this sector, you know, and this is talking the natural resources sector, rather than the headline ones that of tourism and Qantas and Jetstar, etc. So it's, yeah, it's a very interesting poll. So this is again where I think people are going to have their challenges. We're going to have uh, impairment potentially of exploration we're going to have questions certainly whether the projects are impaired i think if you can't get on site you've got no money that you you lose you know the loss of tenure is, is going to be a challenge the you know the collapse in oil oil price obviously there's the direct impact of anybody that that's an oil producer or anybody that's oil exploration 
but there's questions of some of you may have forward contracts that have fixed in the price of oil, the price of diesel, et cetera. Are those now onerous? Um, I think people will be forced to modify convertible notes. The liquidity means you won't be able to repay it. It may be that you can't raise capital as quickly as you could. So you'll be talking to your, your funders to modify notes. You may have some interesting issues where I think there's a risk that your joint venture partners may not be able to handle cash calls, et cetera. So you may stumble across situations where you'll actually gain control of, of a JV. Um, and there are consequences of failing to deliver. So if you fail to deliver into a contract, two aspects of that come up. Are you going to incur LDs? Are you going to incur penalties for failing to deliver your commodity? And equally, remembering this is a, an accounting update, does that actually disqualify you from hedge accounting? So if you're failing to deliver commodities, do you fail the own use exemption and suddenly you've got volatility in your, your reported earnings because you no longer pass the hedge tests? So. The session as we're going to divide it. So the rest of this session, I'm just going to deal with impairment and impacts of SSB9 financial instruments. And then tomorrow, Susan will deal with a whole list of those financial reporting issues and we'll look at regulatory issues, etc. Going concern. Wayne, before we move on, can I ask you a question? We've had a question come through, and this is from one of our clients, Jutta. In terms of lost tenure, most states in Australia have waived covenants during the COVID period. So how do you think that should be factored when looking at this, some of the issues that businesses are facing? Now, that's obviously good, Uta, that's, that's obviously good news for the Australian-based entities. So it removes one of the risks on E and E paragraph 20, but it's still got to be when you when we come to the E and E slide, are you actually planning to give up any areas? Have you got the capacity in today's market to actually perform any E and E? So it, it's de-risked one of the elements for the Australian tenements. And again, it'd be interesting offline to see whether any other governments, whether, it, whether particularly any of the African governments have waived this. Because one of the things I'm, I'm worried at from an audit perspective is, are the mines departments actually open in some of your countries? Have they got the, the capacity to work from home, to, to work remotely? So if you're working, you know, this is not business as normal. So if you were due to uh, renew your tenement or you've actually put your tenement application in, but the government's closed down and they've not given any waivers as, as, as the Australian states have, how are you going to satisfy your auditor that you've still got valid tenure? And remembering you can only capitalise E and E if you've got valid valid tender. Okay, thanks, Susan. Um, so going concern and going concern, and myself and Susan are running a a general accounting update next week. You know, going concern is massive for uh, Virgin Australia for anybody that's in retail, anybody that's in tourism, anybody that's in hospitality, etc. But going concern will most definitely is a consideration for all directors and all auditors as we come into this reporting season. And we're in this weird area that strictly all of our accounting standards only apply if you if you are a going concern. The, the preparation of 
going that your financial statements says you're a going concern and you also have to disclose all of the uncertainties the material uncertainties that exist as at the reporting date being the signing of your financials as to whether there's any risk that you will not be a going concern and there will be issues that if you're running out of cash you've got credit you've not been able to pay creditors you've not been able to renegotiate convertible notes is it appropriate for you to prepare your financial statements on a going concern basis will your auditors sign off even with an emphasis of matter that you are a going concern and is there a risk that your auditors will disclaim whether you're a going concern and what does that mean for the the directors and even your ability to raise uh, finances and this is this wonderful requirement of 101 it's 12 months from when you sign the accounts and how can anybody predict what's going to happen in 12 months time my new hobby is listening to economists argue whether this is going to be a v this is going to be a u whether there's going to be a second wave whether there's going to be a third wave how quickly the economy will uh, recover whether it will recover whether globalization is in decline so you've got to, your cash flows that you'll need to produce will have to be 12 months forecast in potentially the most uncertain times we've ever had to forecast in um going concern how do you factor it in what is your what is your commodity price when are your cash flows going to recover uh pre covid a number of you will be selling off stockpiles a number of you will potentially not be producing but you're still satisfying into into your contracts by selling stock are you happy that that will rebound and some of you will be set selling into existing orders and as the impact of covid goes through the supply chain goes through the economy will those orders uh, will there be reorders and will those reorders be at the same price as you've historically got them so just because you can show very good history of, of predicting and a very good supply base even if you can prove that you've been supplying the commodity in june in in july is it actually reasonable that you can still predict that you've got to be able to have those reorders that will have demand for it and again is there a risk that there's going to be a shock to your business a shock to your your production uh impact because you can't get staff you can't get workers on site or you can't get parts to keep going on site or you can't yeah. ship your your goods um and then when you start to look at your going concern what how many models are you putting forward to consider whether you've got risk are you looking at worst case are you looking yeah. at multiple case scenarios as to how you may be able to continue or not are you then disclosing that those material uncertainties and the reasons for your determination that you're a going concern appropriately in your note one and remembering this is all about risk if you're 
is that disclosure appropriate and is it exposing the directors and the auditors to risk if it's overly optimistic? Um, key areas of going concern. How are your cash flows? How much cash are you going to generate? Are you confident of being able to secure further equity injections? Will you break any of your covenants? Are you aware of how your dipping cash flows, your, your loss of earnings, your ratios, will they breach any of your key covenants? And what is your, your reasonability of revenue forecast? Will your production ability and the supply chain around it enable you to keep on producing at a level or recover back to the, the level as you, you should do? What are your assumptions? You, you know, this is going to, I'm going to read everybody's announcements, everybody's note one. How severe do you think it's going to be on your business? We've had 27% of people in the poll said they were significantly impacted by this. How's it going to recover? What is your forecast as to when we will recover to pre COVID levels or if we will recover to? to what level will we recover? Um, so that's my cheery tale of going concern. Susan, have we had any questions? Why no, we haven't had any questions come through on going concern. Slightly surprising. So if, if people feel free, even though I've moved moving away from going concern. If people have got questions on going concern or anything we do, just people on just type type them through and we'll we'll try and deal with them as we go. Okay. I obviously only get the cheery half of this presentation. So if you've decided you're a going concern or there's uncertainties around your ability to continue as a going concern, a lot of the key challenges is are, have you any assets that are impaired? And then the real challenge in COVID world, if you've decided that they're impaired, what should they be written down to? How do you determine something's recoverable amount, fair value, net realizable value in the world we're currently living in? And I'm trying to group the world of impairment into all of those assets. Um, obviously, a lot of natural resources won't have goodwill, but the struggle of determining what is goodwill, what is the underlying recoverable amount, is a challenge for the for accountants around the world. Property, plants, and equipment. Is it making any profit? Is it being used? Can it be used? Trade and other receivables. For most natural resources, where hopefully our counterparties are normally sound on, on trade receivables, but you can well have loans to JVs, loans to associates. Are those uh, appropriate? Is your inventory impaired? Some commodities are doing well, some commodities are not doing well. How are your stockpiles? How are your secondary uh, stocks doing? Have you got overpaid oil? Have you got consumables that are not being consumed and deteriorating? The natural resources sector lives largely more than any other sector with investments in associates. Have you got any of those investments that are impaired? Do you know whether they're impaired? e and &E, even using IFRS 6, AASB 6, there is a good chance this reporting season e and &E could well be impaired. Lease receivables. I expected this reporting season to be talking about lease accounting and the difficulties of lease accounting. Uh, one of the things to note is if you've recognized a right of use asset, 
is it impaired? So a whole series of assets going through everybody's balance sheets. Do you need to write it off? And a question for everybody on their continuous uh, reporting, at what point do you disclose that you may or be writing down an asset? Uh, we now get to, you know, a lot of people on this call have material capitalized exploration assets. Given the world we live in, given the fact I'm predicting we can't get capital, some of you are oil explorers. Is this an indication of impairment? And just to refresh the boring world we live in, the key paragraph of IFRS 6, AASB 6, is paragraph 20. And hopefully people can just digest that slide. If one of those four items exist, and I do highlight to everybody the list is not exhaustive, we need to test for impairment. And we get thrown into AASB 136, and then people will have to determine the recoverable amount of their E&E. Value in use is never an option for, or normally an option for E&E because by its nature it's not in use. So then we'll be sucked into what is the fair value of your E&E. And that most likely the first point to look, well, well what is your market capitalization? Or are there any other means of determining the fair value of the E and E, et cetera, and are there like transactions going on at the moment? Wayne, we've had a good question come through, and that is, do we actually have to forecast how we're getting out of this when even the government can't make any predictions? Um, and the answer is yes. Because, and it's this, it's this weird aspect that the accounting standards say, as we went through, the accounting standards say you have to disclose the uncertainties out of, out of your uh, going concern and you have to say the key assumptions in it. And although the government, the Australian government has given uh, waiver for directors in, in you know trading insolvently and ASIC have now given people the a one month extension on, on on lodging their financials nobody has carved out the requirements of WASB 101 and that's going to expose as you know this is risk so and the protection, I believe the protection from that risk is through disclosure. But so at some point, you've got to say, well, I believe that my, my going concern is based on the idea that normality will restore in, I don't know, six months by 2021. And this is based on a hope that there isn't a second wave or whatever the, ba the basis is. So this is amazingly challenging and, it, and these are sadly the, the late night calls I have on, on globally in terms of you have to predict, you know, accounting standards require you to predict whether you're a going concern. Accounting standards require you to determine the recoverable amount. And if you ever come up with recoverable amount, you always, or well, 90%, come up with a cash flow forecast, which requires you to predict in these wonderful times, or there's always the backstop of fair value. 
which in most times still goes back to a cash flow. And so unfortunately for accountants, we need to come up with a position as to how we think this is going to work for our organisations. Wayne, people are getting cross with you. We've got <laughs> this come up. So the government can defer budgets and forecasts and we're supposed to have a crystal ball. I think that might be a comment rather than a real question there. I think that is a very valid comment. Um, we are amazing in Australia. You know, the issue that's for most people on this call, and I know there's some guys in, from Asia and Singapore and Hong Kong, but for all the Australians on the call, we are the first cab off the rank. That a lot of stock exchanges, because of all this problem, they're deferring interim arrangements. They're allowing, they're not publishing quarterlies, they're not going to publish half years because they're very nervous that what's the value of having to prepare financial statements in such an uncertain time. We, because we live in the lucky country, we've got 30th of June year ends. We, as an Australians, we're ignoring our, our Kiwi friends with our 31st of March. We are going to have the biggest challenge, a bigger challenge than anybody in the world. So we are going to have to make these predictions and deal with the consequences. The auditors, and I love the fact I, I do less and less audits these days, they are together with the preparers, the directors, they have to be happy with your judgments. If they're not, they could disclaim. Um, so it is a very interesting time and, and it's, it's an Australian phenomena, I think, at the moment. Because hopefully, if putting a Northern Hemisphere hat on, we will have much greater certainty if you're when you're preparing your December financials. But it's the joys of living in Australia, I'm, I'm afraid. Any more comments coming through? Throwing rocks at me, Susan? No. Okay. Impairment of assets. And Obviously, goodwill and definite useful lives have to be tested every year. And all the others, PP&E, right of use assets, intangibles, has there been an impairment indicator? And I do re-emphasize this, we're gonna have, I expected to be presenting this year on a lot of refresher and complications on WASB 16, IFRS 16, the new leasing standard. Now the main issue for me is you've recognized an asset, you recognized an asset when you transitioned 1st of July 2019. Should you impair that asset uh, 30th of June 2020? Just in case you haven't noticed, WASB 136 paragraph 12, have there been significant changes with an adverse effect the entity during the period? 27% people said there's been a significant, the COVID's impacted them significantly, 61% to a minor extent. Internal sources, paragraph 12, F, and G, have there been significant adverse effects that are, have or will happen that would cause you? So I expect everybody will have impairment triggers. And this is going to have to be dealt with, again, value in use, fair value, less cost of disposal. Give me the cash flows or the fair value in these extremely uncertain times. 
all about cash flows, list of your assets, which ones are written down. And again, if you are going to have material write downs, when do you tell them market? And again, people on this call, because we're natural resources, this extends into your associates, it extends into your JVs. It, and a number of you will have operations overseas. Are there problems in your jurisdictions that you're, you're operating in, or is there about to be problems in the jurisdictions? Okay. Inventories. Have you got, are you down? How are you actually valuing your, your production at the moment? How are you valuing your stockpiles? Are you producing at the same rate as you'd normally produce? Can you get people on site? Can you get the goods off site? You can't just keep on allocating overhead into a smaller amount of production. You have to only allocate normal capacity when you're applying the inventory standard. JVs, associates, what is the carrying value of your JV? What is your associate? Remember, quite a few of you will, in effect, have goodwill being the carrying value of your, your associate. If you bought into an associate, you will have that. It, it is higher than the net assets of the, the associate. So you have got assets that need tested for impairment. I'll emphasize that this is an asset in an associate and or it's a loan to a JV or an associate. These are covered by the impairment requirements in SSB 9 or SSB 136. They're not automatically covered or they're not covered at all by this special exemption in paragraph 20 of IFRS 6, SSB 6. Have you got contingencies? Have you guaranteed amounts into your associates? What are your cash calls? What are your obligations to fund into associates, JVs? Are they struggling for cash? Are your joint venture partners or other people struggling to fund the associates and the exposure will come back to you? WSB 12, IS 12, you're only allowed to recognize assets if it's probable that you will be able to recover them with all the change that's going on will your tax losses be assessable will they be recoverable will even your timing differences uh, be able to be used and reversed financial assets we introduced the new loss model we introduced WASB 9 if you've got trade receivables, you're supposed to predict 12 months expected loss for loans to your JVs, loans to your subsidiaries, loans to your associates. You need to see whether there's been a significant deterioration in credit risk. There is a large probability that there will have been a significant deterioration in credit risk to some of your associates, some of your JVs. Again, that will require impairment. Just another list of various ways of dealing with your ECL, your expected credit loss. How have you assessed it? Are they struggling? And then how are you predicting how much you will lose? How much will you recover from not being able to get those loans repaid or certainly not being getting those loans repaid at the date you're expecting them to? Um, guarantees. This is actually genuinely under the impairment section of the 
of these slides, a number of you automatically will have issued financial guarantees to your subsidiaries, to your associates, to your JVs. Has that caused an issue with your guarantee? Do you need to book a loss in your, your financials? Major area where I'm expecting uh, people to modify their arrangements are modify repayments of convertible notes, your debt, your loans. It all makes economic sense. You will hopefully negotiate your loans, repay your loans, change the terms of the shares, pay the terms of the share based payments, etc. But that is complicated from a revaluation uh, aspect. So were the were these renegotiations that I expect or hope everybody will have? Was it substantial? Was it non-substantial? Do you have to de-recognize the old loan and re-recognize a new loan? All accounting issues, all complicated accounting issues. And certainly if you do have to de-recognize and re-recognize, we're back to the wonderful challenge of this reporting season, what is the fair value uh, of that new recognition? And how do you determine what's the fair value of potentially a distressed loan? Uh, as I touched on earlier in, in the presentation, a number of you have got a qualified genuinely for hedge accounting, and that is based on the premise it was highly probable is it now highly probable can you still demonstrate that the cash flows will happen will you actually buy that oil will you need that oil will you be able to sell into a, a contract will you have the exposure to fx that you were expecting your projects are delayed etc Okay, so that was session one. There's a cheery session of just dealing with, with those issues of going concern and asset impairment. And tomorrow, same time, we will go through dis we will go through disclosure again revenue recognition, lease accounting, recognizing provisions, owner's contracts, accounting for government support, recognizing government's going to be, in some governments, they're going to be providing support for staff, they're going to be produce, providing support for leases. A number of you will be renegotiating your lease arrangements and for those people that weren't on the exciting live webinar at the listening to the, the ISB on Friday evening, there has been a rush through change to how we can potentially account for some of your leases that you've managed to get a concession from from your the lessor. So that's what Susan will be dealing with tomorrow. So over to you, Susan. Have we had any questions? Um, we have had some questions, Wayne. One of the ones is for explorers, normally they're looking at their ability to access capital as to whether they've got going concern issues. So has that really changed given COVID? I think so. well, so the, the fact that they've desperately got to look at their ability to raise capital uh, hasn't changed. And I don't know, as we, we're here on the 20th of May, how well juniors are raising capital. You know, the headlines have got some very big capital raises, almost desperation 
raises when you when you look at the the amount that say uh, flight center etc have raised we will have to see between now and September just how successful people will be will be raising capital and it's going to be this is the crystal ball but we will know better by September if people have tried to have an offer open and it's not been subscribed that's going to cost real doubts about your ability to continue as a going concern if you're deliberately postponing raising capital because your brokers and your advisors have said now's not a good time that obviously needs to be factored into your going concern assessment so yeah it's back to a lot of change a lot of, i think we've been in lockdown 55 days or something how the equity markets are going to react to the juniors we we just all sit and wait and see and, and cross our fingers until september wayne with share based payments you know what what changes are you seeing that are happening in the marketplace it's, um, it's, it's a question versus seeing versus predicting I'm expecting it, it, it is how ready and how people have actually got to work and how people are getting their head around it. So I expect a good, a sensible arrangement is you encourage all your senior executives or your, your geo, senior geos, et cetera, and of course, all of the accountants on the call to accept shares rather than cash. And I don't know when that will happen. I don't know what you've been promised. And I don't know what the companies will have to offer in order to get their employees to be persuaded to accept it. I do think people will start to modify their share based payments. That the, you know, the, the vesting condition was now the vesting condition was genuinely as at the in the first half of 2020 or the vesting condition you know involved having a jork by this date or having a, a, a bankable feasibility by that date now you've not been allowed on site you can't get drilling is it fair that 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 vesting condition still stands or will fairness change the arrangement you know common sense and fairness says i think it will change but the accounting standard then kicks in to say ah you've modified it what's the new fair value well wayne that's really the issue that people are having is that they issued shares before covid and now the share prices are about a third of what they previously were. So if they issue more shares, you know, that's or modify the scheme, then it accelerates the vesting. I think that's going to be an issue that people are going to have with what the reported results will be by virtue of amending these share based payments. And you're making the presumption you can even get into modification. You well, run exactly, the risk. because otherwise it's a cancellation and it's just immediate vesting of the previous um, payment that you had. And, you know, I've seen situational, potential situations where you agree that you're going to pay somebody a tenth of their, or 10%, 50% of their monthly salary for three years based on a floating share price, which all makes wonderful sense but the accounting is horrible and you end up front loading and because you end up with a, if you're doing it for three years, potentially you've got 36 different plans and you recognize, uh, what, you, you recognize 100% of one plan in, in month one and 50% of the same planning. So you end up front loading the, the share based payment in a, in a very unpleasant ma manner. 
and all of these things genuine you know, you know from from the people on this call if you are looking at modifying your share based payments if you are looking at modifying your loans your con notes etc cetera, etc cetera, it would be really useful to to to, to speak to your auditors yeah, well, one of the questions we've got come through just now is if no modification occurs and the share price dropped with the previous, will the previous valuation stand or does it need to be adjusted? It's done. So it, well. that is options <laughs> issued to employees with future vesting conditions. I think we've got bad news on that one, haven't we? There's not much good news on this call, but yeah, it, it's unlikely <laughs> that you get any dispensation of the accounting firm. So a question came through for me, and that is, are we able to access the presentation materials? And the answer to that is yes. Um, we'll email you a copy of the webinar and slides later today. Um, so that is to thank everyone for attending and hopefully they can join us tomorrow um, when we recap and really talk about the disclosure requirements and what needs to go into the accounts um, in relation to this and where we're seeing or what we're anticipating will be the impacts. And I'm actually anticipating a fair bit. I don't think the 31 December year ends, people have got off lightly if they're producing half year accounts at 30 June, um, because a lot of the assumptions that they had in their previous accounts have changed now because of the new world. Do you have any comments on that one? No, no, I was, I was recording, I was when I was talking 31st of December, I was talking that. Northern Hemisphere. Uh, absolutely, you're Australian. You are the lucky country. You've got problems either with your 30th of June or you've got major problems with your half year, 30th of June. Well, we have had the comment come through though that they'd rather live here and put up with the slight problems of reporting than having to actually deal with the coronavirus in a bad way that Europe is experiencing. I would underline that 100%. I did. I was being, I did refer to it as the lucky country, and I believe it is the lucky country. But, <laughs> yes. Now, remarkably, we've only run, overrun by four minutes, which, knowing my past performance, is, is one of my great successes of this year. So, thank you very much for attending, and we'll speak tomorrow. Thank you.